follow the data. I think that's <laughs> my biggest thing. <laughs> like, like what, what is your data showing? If you're, and it's not for everybody, right? Every company's culture is different. I mean, that's the biggest mistake we make is we think that we can just copy paste what someone else is doing and it's going to be okay. Yeah. And even we, we do it, we see it with like DEI strategies or people think, oh, if they're doing this. Let me just copy paste. And it doesn't work that way. Every company is different. The cultures are different. Your people need different things. And so following what your data says, not just copying the latest trends and following what your team members are telling you and using that to really drive your decision and drive your strategy. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the HR Leaders Podcast. On today's episode, I'm joined by Stephanie Murphy, who is a people analytics leader, a management professor, speaker, and talent analytics director at Dell Technologies. During the episode, Stephanie shares how Dell is transforming work with listening data, how to use data and analytics to drive hybrid work strategy, and how to drive accountability in DEI. As always, before we jump into the video, make sure you hit the subscribe button, turn on the notification bell, and follow on your favorite podcast platform. With that being said, let's jump in. Stephanie, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm good. How are you, Chris? I'm good. Nice to see you again. It feels like forever since your last vote. It's been a minute. It's been a minute. (laughs) So you're currently trapped inside in the cold right now. We don't get that in the UK. So you snowed in. (laughs) Well, it's not even snow is the funny thing. We're iced in. (laughs) Iced in? What's... Oh, right. <laughs> so it rained and then all the rain froze all over the streets. So oh. they shut down all the schools, work, oh everything. Oh my God, it's even you worse than that. House. You could just be sliding around everywhere. I had, exactly. I've only had that once and it was, um, it's, it's a first world problem, so I can't complain too much. But the Tesla car that I have, there's no handles because, so the hand, uh. they're flush. So the handles froze. So we couldn't get into <laughs> the car. So I was trying to do the nursery run in the morning with Robin and I was like, we couldn't get in the car for like 20, 20 30 minutes. <laughs> I was like, the most first world problem I've I ever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Poor you with your Tesla. What are you going right. to do? And I was like, yeah, it's all good at having this amazingly um, functional tech, tech enabled car, but I can't get in. Right. Can't get it. In. <laughs> yeah. So they fixed it though with an update where it pops it out. So good on Elon okay. <laughs> for, right. for, good. for doing that. Um, tell everyone a little bit before we jump in, tell everyone a little more about you, your background and your journey to where we are now. Yeah, yeah. So Stephanie Murphy, uh, I'm an IO psychologist. I got my master's and PhD in IO psych from Louisiana Tech University a long time ago. (laughs) (laughs) Um, uh, Born and raised in Louisiana. I actually moved to to Texas for the first time when I got the job at Dell. Um, So interned at Dell in 2014 and fell in love with the people and the culture and the flexibility and the family-centered environment and never left. Uh, Um, 10 years, right? You said 10 years? It's been almost nine nine years. Yep. Nine years. Wow. Um, Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So it's been awesome. Um, I run our employee engagement and listening strategy, our research and our talent research strategy, as well as our assessment strategy. Yeah. We're speaking off, off, offline before we hit record and you're doing so much that we were like, what do we even talk about <laughs> during the podcast? You're, just, you're doing so many amazing... Like, how do we focus? <laughs> yeah, how, how do we focus? Exactly. To be honest, that's normally one of the questions I ask your peers. How do you choose what you focus on? Mm, right? Because that's, that's, cha- <laughs> that's a big challenge yes. in itself. Uh, so funny that we're actually saying that. Um, yep, as well. Yep, yep. So, so this role in, in, a way, in many ways didn't exist when you, you know, were studying, you know, elements of it, of course, it was called something different, you know, but it's mm-hmm. kind of been a, a huge transformation. How, how have you yeah. found that journey and that evolution of that continuous learning for yourself? Yeah, it's so interesting because the work was there, right? So even like as an intern, I remember doing the analytics behind our employee engagement survey. And then I was asked to go look at this research project on accountability. And so I was doing, and then there was like an assessment thing that I had (laughs) to go do. So there was all the pieces were there. just didn't know what to call it. So at the time we were calling it global talent management was the name of the team. Mm -hmm. And we were doing all of these different things that I loved. I just didn't know what it, what it, what it looked like. And so fast forward, like you said, a couple of years down the line, the, the line, we kind of started forming a team of like, okay, wait, this actually makes sense to all sit here and like <laughs> make sense to call it this. And so we had like, the, the names have changed so many times. It went from global talent <laughs> yeah. management to, I think, to HR strategy at one point. Then we switched it to like talent <laughs> management in general, talent and culture. And then eventually it became insights and assessments, which is what it was like now. <laughs> yeah. So your role, you've obviously got head of talent analytics, but is that broadly people analytics function itself? 
And just yeah, so I recently took on a new role. So I oh, okay, another one. Uh, like, like, <laughs> okay. uh, like, right, <laughs> like two weeks ago, <laughs> a new role, um, actually last, right before the holidays. And so global talent analytics is a different function that just takes all the analytics and puts it aside. Okay. So my previous role was people insights and assessments, which was the assessments research mm-hmm. and, 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 and um, listening strategy all in one. Now I lead the talent analytics function, which includes uh, GHRS analytics, DNI analytics, all the listening strategy analytics, but not the program management, mm-hmm. and then all of the kind of um, uh, t- talent acquisition analytics too. And so the focus is trying to create an end-to-end view of the of the employee experience from the time someone hits apply and becomes a candidate to the time they exit and take their exit interview or survey, being able to see all those, mo- those moments that matter and all throughout the process and look at that full analytics picture. Amazing, amazing. Well, I know I read some some stuff you, you, you and the team did around um, how you're using data and analytics to drive your hybrid work strategy. I'd love to jump into that. Obviously, a big challenge for everyone. We're all learning yeah. <laughs> along yeah. the way. Could, yeah. you, could you share kind of how, how both who are the stakeholders involved in that and kind of where you started on that journey? So it's interesting. Dell was in a unique position where we've been hybrid, quote unquote, depending on your definition of hybrid. We've always had work flexibility um, since I joined. Um, so I started when I moved here to Texas in 2014, I worked in the office maybe one year um, and then I went remote for most of it. And so I would go into the office when I kind of had big meetings with key stakeholders. But for the most part, I was remote, even though I live still live four minutes away from the office. Do you? And so, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so I probably go into the office literally once every two months. That's hilarious. Um, just because, <laughs> you know, but it's the flexibility of being able to, you know, wash my clothes while I'm in the middle of like you know, meeting stuff is, is amazing. But mm-hmm. Dell has always had that culture. And we actually had a goal to get 50% of our workforce remote by 2020, which we met that goal. But due to the pandemic, right? Yeah, yeah. And so because of that, we've always had this culture that was very flexible. Um, so we had that as an advantage. We were able to get all of our team members, all 140,000 folks remote within one weekend because the infrastructure was already there. So when the pandemic hit over the weekend, we were able to knock it all out. We already had the, the software and the technology and the clouds and all of these things in place to be able to do that. Um, so our next thing was figuring out like, okay, where do we go from here? <laughs> like, what does this look like going forward? Um, and so we did a lot of research. We listened to our team members. Our big thing is data-driven decisions. And Michael Dell talks about it all the time. I'm just like, no matter what we do in the business with our team members, it's like, where's the data? Where's the research? Um, so we listened to our team members. We sent out several surveys to understand how they feel about vaccines when we open back up. How did they feel about working from home? Did they miss the office? And just asking just really straightforward questions. Um, um, and allowing that data to really shape how we looked at remote work. We did a lot of kind of who, once we opened offices back, who was coming in, how frequently they were coming in, how, why were people coming in? Were they coming in for core meetings? Were they coming in to socialize? Which for the most part, people were coming in to, to yeah, socialize yeah. and be around people and collaborate. It wasn't necessarily, oh, I'm more productive at the office anymore. It was more so I miss seeing faces. <laughs> I've been cooped up in my house for two years. Yeah. Um, and so using that data to really see Different people had different experiences and different needs. And that's what shaped our whole flexible work strategy going forward. We're like, you don't have to come back into the office. You can come back into the office. You don't have to get a vaccine if you don't want to. You can come and you know show your, your test results for the day. And so just making sure that like flexibility was at the core of everything that we did. Because when we looked at the data, it was all over the place. Different people wanted and needed different things at different times. And we wanted to allow our team members to be yeah. able to do what worked best for them. What were some of the key takeaways that you took away from those listening tours? Yeah, I think a big one we had we had like what we call our myth busters, where we bust a lot of myths we were hearing out in the in the the universe. That's a good segment for the show. Everywhere. What are the what are the <laughs> myths? Hybrid work myths. There we go. Go for it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. One was that you can't fill the culture remote. We actually found that 94% of our team members felt like they could still feel the culture, even in the virtual world. You still felt the collaboration, the winning together type of values that we had. Um, another one was that new people will come in and they they won't like it. They won't like the fact that they're not in the office. The younger generation or the early in career folks, we found that that's not the case. Um, there was another one that was more along the lines of, um, I'm drawing a blank, 
uh, there were so many of them. <laughs> we had like yeah. five or six of them. And they would just walk through all these different kind of myths that people felt about remote work and hybrid work. And mm-hmm. we were able to use the data to say that's not how our team members feel or that is or maybe it's not. But looking at the data to really drive those myths. Yeah. Which you, when you sat down with uh, your CHRO and the team, which are the areas that you choose to focus your time and energy on? Because you can't, you know, so- solve it. You can't focus on everything. What were the key ones yeah. that you took away? So, okay, this is where we feel we can have impact. Yeah, a lot of it is driven by what we hear externally. So we recently tackled quiet quitting, right? That was something we were hearing all over the internet and stuff like that. And leaders were starting to be concerned. Oh my gosh, is my team quiet quitting? So what do, you, what do we do? We ask a bunch of questions in the survey about quiet quitting and engagement because we felt, we felt like it was old wine in a new bottle, right? Like a quiet quitting. Think rebrand. It was like a rebrand. Right. Yeah. <laughs> rebrand. <laughs> right. And so we looked at it and we're like, no, our team members are not quiet quitting. And then putting that in data and for, like we use a lot of infographics and, and mm-hmm. one tip, t- we call them tip sheets and like put tips together about how to keep your team engaged. And then we share that with our leaders and things like that. So it's a way to like, take what's going on externally, what's going on with like, you know, all the the layoffs and things like that happening. People are feeling uncertain. How how do we use data to really help solve some of those problems for our leaders Mm -hmm. and provide them with the resources they need to to lead during difficult times? Mm -hmm. And so a lot of our prioritization is based on what's going on externally and what are our team members saying and then merging those two things together to help come up with the plan forward. Give us an example of like a specific thing that you heard from the lead uh, from your from your uh, employees, and then that you actioned and then provided some insights and resources to your leaders to help. What was one of the examples of things that you did? Yeah, one of them was, and this was something that came out of our survey, where the, I think there was a couple of times where that meaningful work showed up as like a key driver of a lot of different things. And so leaders were like, okay, well, how do I make someone that's in a call center or someone that's, you know, in our services department feel like their work is meaningful? And so we did a bunch of external research and kind of put together like a tip, we call them tip sheets, like I mentioned, tip sheet. Mm-hmm. It was like, here's how you can make people understand that their work is meaningful, tie it to our strategy, you know, and a bunch of just different, like we put like five or six like key tips of like mm-hmm. ways to show work is someone's work is meaningful to the company. Um, and, and that was something practical leaders were able to take and go do. And that's been our big thing is like, we do a lot of cool data and analytics and research and things like that. But if it's too high level, yeah. leaders are like, okay, what do I do with that? Just give so me some tips. We... Just exactly. Just it, give me exactly. five things I can do. That's it. <laughs> right. They don't need to know all of the regression analysis and <laughs> things that we did behind the scenes to get there. Here are the four things that are important and key that you can go yeah. take and actually practically use. How, how do you deliver that to them? What, what's the best way you found of getting that information into the hands of those leaders? Yes, our comms team is fantastic. We partner very closely with them. We have like meetings with them all the time, um, but mostly through uh, we have like what we call manager essentials, and we have a team member version called Team Member Essentials, and it's an email that goes out once or twice a month that has just key resources and key things up and coming that leaders need to know. Mm-hmm. And so we usually put our tip sheets in there, or we integrate it into our practice too, like in the flow of other things that leaders have to do. Like if it's something about onboarding or hiring, how do we put that resource right there in the middle of when they're doing their day to day work? Mm-hmm. How is the uh, how is how from obviously all of the research you've done? How has that shaped your hybrid strategy now? What's the kind of model? Is there a particular model? Is it like team by team? You decide how you want to how and when you want to work together, or is there a policy across the whole company? What does that look like? Yeah, it is completely up to the individual, and we encourage our leaders to to push that narrative as well. Like the individual has the choice to show up in the office or they have the choice to work from home or be hybrid, however they want to work. There are some times we'll do like offsites and stuff sure. where like everyone will come into an office just to meet up and kind of meet each other. But for the most part, it's completely up to the individual to provide that. They have the flexibility to do this, they please. Nice. What, what are some of the challenges that have come up? I can imagine, you know, it's not all been plain sailing. <laughs> yeah, I think the biggest one is connection, right? Like, I think that's the biggest thing we see pop up is people want that collaboration. And it is like very different. Like even when my team, we all met in person. It's a very different vibe to be sitting there. You know, I think we went to like top golf and played games and stuff, right? <laughs> it's very different, like being in the room with people and having those interactions and um, than it is being virtual. So I think that's probably the piece that we see team members miss the most. But having those offsites and those frequent abilities to meet in person is the way we solve for them. Yeah. On that point then, how have you, um, 
one of the big challenges I hear is around, you know, how do you make sure that you have that, that both in office and remote workers feel equally valued? Ah, yeah, yeah. That um, was one of our myths. Uh, that we oh, was that one of the myths? Okay. Uh, that was one of our myths busters. So <laughs> okay. like I mentioned before, Dell has always had remote and non-remote people for years, right? Even before the pandemic. And we did a study before the pandemic where we found that remote workers were not less likely to be promoted. They were just the same oh, okay. amount to have leader support. And, and then we did a recent one after the pandemic where we looked at similar concepts and, and same thing, not less likely to, more likely to actually be, uh, to stay at the company. So more uh, likely- Is it getting more flexibility, the more- you know, Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So we haven't seen that within our data where we see there's a big disadvantage for remote workers versus in person. Interesting. That must come back to a lot to to to, to the work you're doing with the leadership team and those line managers then. Right? Yeah. That's- yeah. I think a lot of it has to do with we provide the resources to our leaders to really make sure that they're allowing everyone they, they have what they need to make sure they're being inclusive of all team members. Yeah. At the end of the day, it is about inclusion, whether you're in the office or not, and being fostering that inclusive environment for all. When you speak to your peers, uh, I'm sure many of them ask you, you know, what's your advice about how do you build a hybrid work strategy? You can't give them the whole entire plan, you'll be there forever. But what's the main number one piece of advice you give to people when it when they talk about building up their hybrid work strategy? I follow the data. I think that's <laughs> my biggest thing. <laughs> like, like what, what is your data showing? If you're, and It's not for everybody, right? Every company's culture is different. I think mean, that's the biggest mistake we make is we think that we can just copy paste what someone else is doing and it's going to be okay. Yeah. And even we, we do it, we see it with like DEI strategies or people think, oh, if they're doing this, let me just copy paste. And it doesn't work that way. Every company is different. The cultures are different. Your people need different things. And so following what your data says, not just copying the latest trends, and following what your team members are telling you and using that to really drive your decision and drive your strategy. Mm-hmm. Talking of that, do you have dashboards like the managers can access? Like what 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 what, what kind of um, technology or partners are you working with just like curiosity? Yeah, yeah. So for most of the, uh, like our listening and stuff, we work with Perceptics. And so yeah, okay. our, we have a bunch of like our leaders can go in and see their team results and their Perceptics dashboards and things like that. We also have a couple of them through Tableau. Yeah. Why? Why Because there's so many, so many companies out there. I'm always interested because uh-huh. one of our challenges of our listeners is they're bombarded with a million different companies. As you can, I'm sure you are too, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, why? Every why did? Why did you email. choose? Why did you choose them as your preferred partner? So interestingly, we've been with Perceptics since they only had 35 people and now they're in hundreds, right? Yeah. So we started with Perceptics. I think we went to their conference and they gave us a little button because we made like six or seven years with them. (laughs) Um, And so (laughs) it's, it's one of those where we started with them because we didn't. A lot of times, listening kind of custom, uh, vendors will sell their their consulting, and they, yeah. they they provide all these different benchmarks and resources and research. We didn't need that. We had IO psychologists internally, and so we had a lot of the consulting and stuff and the research. But that was a whole branch, right? Like our talent research, yeah. we had that, and so we really wanted to sleep technology from a customer from a vendor at that point. Um, and and Perceptus had a really good just like technology where they had like cool buttons and visuals and things like that that made a really good user experience and so we were in there at the time they were so small they were very flexible so we were able to create a lot of things with them build our reports like i think we were making our our power reports in powerpoint sending it to them and they were able to replicate exactly what we wanted and needed in the dashboard is like Mm. exactly and we need we need a lot of flexibility we believe in customizing everything um customizing our assessments customizing (laughs) everything um to what what we need and so it was very helpful to have a partner that was willing to customize with us what's the feedback been from like the managers who are using it because that's a hard <laughs> uh it was <laughs> How's that experience? Yeah. 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 So our employee engagement survey gets a 96% response rate, which is ridiculously wow. high for the industry. And so uh, it's our engagement survey that we use with Perceptics with is probably like best in class. We call it one of our signature practices for the company. Uh, leaders, if you talk to anyone at Dell and you ask them, what is Tell Dell? Everyone will know exactly what it really? is. Really? Really? Yes, I was actually in a bar one time. And no I was, way. Like, sitting there <laughs> and they were talking about Tell Dell scores. And I'm just like, oh, that's that's me. Oh, yeah, <laughs> that's Tell a Dell proud Dell. moment right there. Exactly. <laughs> right. But you built a brand around it though, right? Like just to want to emphasize that for everyone listening, you, you built Tell Dell. Like you, you, you created a brand around it so people remember, right? Because otherwise it would just become yeah. the dashboard. 
that no one really exactly. goes to. <laughs> exactly. And so it's super cool the way that like it's just engraved within the culture. Everyone knows the dates when it's coming. Team members know that it's something that their leaders are going to value the feedback from. They have feedback conversations on it. And so because of that, I think it's just been a really big part of how um, how our leaders understand how they're doing and how they can improve. But also from a company perspective, it's how we know what to do and what we need to fix and improve for our, for mm. our team members. What does it look like um, in terms of the usability for you and the team? Like how, how are you using the front end? Oh, sorry, the back end yeah. of it. Apologies. Yeah. Of it. Super helpful. I think the dashboard and then again, back to customizing, we can put all of our HR data into it too. And so we can go cut by all these different variables that we have within our HR systems and really be able to pinpoint, you know, what's working, where thing, where are hot spots that we need to focus on within the company um, from a diversity perspective, being able to look at the different demographics and figure out where do we see low scores, where do we see high scores. And so it's just been amazing to have a tool that allows that flexibility for us. Cool. I'm always interested to hear it, right? That's so nice. Uh, yeah. and, and that you've grown together and customized because no one really wants that off the shelf experience, right? It has to be tailored to the organizations, to the teams, to the individuals. You created a good brand message around it that people remember. Talking about in a bar, that's crazy. That's a crazy <laughs> story. <laughs> so I was talking about in a bar um, <laughs> as well. It's a good job. I, I, I did want to jump into the, the DI analytics side. It's something that, you know, yeah, not many people I speak to even can even talk about it because they don't really have any, any great use cases. What are some of the challenges you're, you're solving with uh, DI analytics? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is been accountability, right? Like I think we can talk the talk, but unless mm. we're having actions behind it, it's not something that's going to move forward. And so Dell announced years ago our 2030 goals, which is the numbers, right? Making sure we have at least 50% women, making sure we have at least 25% Black Hispanic in the U.S. These are all goals that we set years ago just to make sure that we were driving the numbers. But the other part that my team has been a part of is the inclusion part. And so uh, it's making sure that if we bring people in, they're going to stay in, not just the numbers, right? But driving the inclusion part as well. And so we added... uh, We always had inclusive questions in our survey, but we added a a category, a separate category with a bunch of inclusion questions in it. Um, And that category, we say people have to have at least a 75% from their team. So all 12,000 of our leaders get a score on that inclusion category as well as other categories. But for DEI purposes, that inclusion category is really important. If you're lower than 60%, you have to have a conversation, you you get the option of having a conversation in the first year. The second year, if you're lower, then you have to have a mandatory consultation. Interesting. Third year, there's some form of disciplinary action, whether that be that you're no longer a leader or something like that. But it's a really huge piece of like driving inclusion. Um, And our leaders have to have conversations with their teams. So each leader sits down and has a conversation with their team about their score. So if it's a low score, high score, whatever it is, they talk about it in ways to improve. And we provide them resources and action planning guides to have those dialogues. Um, But it's really key to how we drive inclusion and hold leaders accountable for driving inclusion within their teams. Wow. Random question. Who's who's having that conversation with the CEO? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> about his Fantastic score about Michael's question. score <laughs> well, Michael also gets to tell Dell report so he has the same standards <laughs> I always make that joke I always think like who's the person who has to sit down with the CEO and go through their score <laughs> as well poor, poor CHRO has to have that conversation I'm sure <laughs> I always think the same with HR right who's having a conversation with the CHRO <laughs> about their score uh-huh. too so anyway it's good, good to point. how long has that been in place no? Uh, two years ago. We started it two years ago. So this this will be the third year we do it. How's, how, how's it been so far? What's the, the, the... Oh, it's been fantastic. Uh, we've seen so much improvement in the scores year over year. I just got an email like last month that showed the percentage of improvements in scores and things like that. So it's been fantastic to see the impact it's having. Mm-hmm. Have you seen this filter into the business from a cultural standpoint? You know, shape the culture, if that makes sense. Because we spoke about earlier, right? You can have all of these things in place, but if you don't have a culture of inclusion, then people just leave just as fast. Have you seen that start to shape the way the conversations are happening? Yeah. And so, like I mentioned, we've always had the questions and the questions have always been pretty high. At one point, I think years ago, I put an inclusion index in the survey and ended up taking it out because we were so high. It was like pointless. I was like, why are these scores so high? I was upset. Like, <laughs> I'm like I shouldn't be upset about the high inclusion scores. But I'm like, <laughs> as a data person, I'm like, I'm trying to find the bad things. Um, <laughs> so I ended up taking it out and then we put it back in. And so yeah. our scores are high, but I think the, it's less... Uh, our, 
our environment is inclusive, I would say, for the most part. What this does, though, is help us pinpoint those few bad apples. Yeah. So it's less about kind of changing the culture. The culture has been pretty inclusive. The scores, like I mentioned, have been high for years, but it's more so pinpointing where we can do better and not accepting 95% of people or feel like they're in an inclusive environment. Okay, well, let's pinpoint those 5% and get them either out of here or get them improved. Yeah. And so it's it's more so pinpointing where we can where we can change and who we can change versus changing the culture in general. How does that make you feel when you say that? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, as a black woman, yeah. it's fantastic to see the scores. Like I mentioned, <laughs> like just like knowing that I work at a place that fosters this inclusive environment for, for all. And then I, I also, I teach at the University of Texas. Nice. Um, I teach the DEI course. And so I, I, I always brag on Dell uh, so much <laughs> even in my class. I'm like, hey, like, if you're going to work anywhere, work for Dell. It's really inclusive. But, you know, it also helps me feel like yeah. that we're not, we're ple- like Michael says this all the time, pleased but never satisfied, right? Like we're happy with it, but never satisfied with just the fact that like, okay, 95, 96%, well, mm-hmm. where's there's the 4% that we got to go fix. And so I like that we drive for excellence in, in all spaces. Including, including. You know, what's great. Like you get to those points where like those people almost self-select them out of the company. Because, you know, and employees will kind of do that job for you. Like, you're not someone who should, you know, you know does that make sense? You know, you have like, it's a, a good point. You have that like sort of friendship. You have, everyone has their own little friendship circles where people try and come in and you're like, that's not who we are. That's not our culture. That's not our values. And this isn't the place for you. You probably get already, you probably get into that point already where that's a natural evolution <laughs> that happens in right, business. Right, right. If you're a leader and you're getting these low tell Dell scores every year, eventually yeah. you're like, okay, I'm obviously this is not working for me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and you self-select out. Yeah, nice. Um, random question, but um, I, you've obviously heard everyone talking about chat GPT. Every, like, mm-hmm. it's, you can't go on the internet without looking at it. Everyone's like, my job's going to go. Um, what are your thoughts around the implications of chat GPT on people analytics? Is that something you've thought about? Just out of curiosity, just randomly came to my mind. Right. It's a great question. I mainly hear about it in my academic job. Then I hear about it because, you know, students are starting to yeah. be able to spit out some fantastic test results from <laughs> <laughs> some very creative, you know, essays are being written. Um, but and I haven't thought about it in terms of people analytics yet. No, I was just wondering if you kind of saw any implications in the role that you do and how you could maybe utilize it to, yeah. you know, for example, like a, as a as an employee feedback tool, right? You know, being able to program it and, and link the API and for employees to be able to chat and get faster results, whether they want to get something to check out their benefits, for example, or any or anything. How many holidays yeah. do I have left for the year? Um, <laughs> right. so, so, something like that. Or just to ask you in the team a question and you can co- yeah. sort of collect that data and the sentiment analysis that comes through it. So I think it's yeah. going to be pretty interesting. I think it's, it is, it is. Well, and I know like being a tech company, we've got our bots, right? So we have chat bots and stuff already mm-hmm. internally. So I, I haven't thought about using anything externally just because we, we also build the sentiment. No surprise there. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, for you, um, what are you most excited about moving forward? I think it's to your pre- your earlier question. Like I'm excited about the people in the space just becoming so much more prevalent. Mm. Uh, I think it was Don Don Kill. What is her name? Don Kill. <laughs> Don K. I'll okay, just say this. Don that. People <laughs> analytics at Microsoft. <laughs> Dawn, Kling, uh, Dawn made- Klinghoffer. Thank you. I wasn't. She's a good friend it, of ours, so no worries. <laughs> yes, I was like, I knew you knew to help me get there. <laughs> right. um, she mentioned this, and I thought it was best where she said that the 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 thing that, that has happened the most during the pandemic, the the twin crises, she called them, between the pandemic and also the racial reckoning after the murder of George Floyd, has mm-hmm. been the importance of people analytics and data. I think since 2020 and having both of those things happen, everyone's been like, oh, wait, we need to be using data to drive all these decisions. And I think that focus has been amazing for our space and just trying to like becoming more important and people realizing the importance of using, you know, uh, whether it be dashboards or HR data, listening data, whatever the source is, using yeah. that information to really drive how we view our it's almost like uh, driving with a blindfold on. Otherwise, <laughs> if, you don't, yeah. if you don't, especially yeah. now, companies are distributed, remote, etc. You know, before people com- companies felt comfortable because everyone they could see everyone, right? They could speak to exactly. everyone. They're all in this place yeah. called our office, which I feel like in the future, me describing that to Robin, she's gonna be like, "What do you mean you had an office?" 
that you went to, right? Like it's going to like, work is no, no longer a place you go to, right? That's even that is it's crazy to think about. So the idea that you wouldn't have the data <laughs> to, it, right? it is almost crazy to think right. about, especially and the pandemic, like Dawn said, just massively leapfrogged us forward on on did. on, on that did. journey, right? It makes you wonder what we did beforehand, right? <laughs> like how well, were we making some of this? Who did businesses turn to when they were trying to figure out stuff with the pandemic? They turned to the people analytics team. All of a sudden it's like, where do we keep offices open? Where do we close them? Where's, where's you know, what, how are each of the different geographies impacted on what's happening with COVID? Right. All of a sudden, <laughs> it just kind of jumped to the forefront, right? Making real estate decisions, life and death decisions, literally. Right. Um, you know, and obviously there was a lot of stress and uh, that went yeah. along with that as well. So it's, it's, that's been absolutely amazing to see the function evolve. As you know, we do our People Analytics Summit every year. Um, yeah. as well and one of, it's one of my favorite of events that every year because I can really see the evolution and, and more importantly the, the impact and the way it's changing people's lives but also shaping society as well and the communities uh, around as well so it's really impactful work um, before I let you go what's your kind of what would be your parting piece of advice of those for those people analytics leaders of tomorrow you know, what advice would you give what do you wish that someone told you <laughs> when you first joined yeah. and then where can people connect with you after that to, to reach out? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is 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 the, the people part of people analytics. I think we often, as we're getting into this space where we're, you know, starting to get so many different software companies and all these different technologies pop up and chat GPTs and things like that <laughs> and all these cool things starting to happen, we're reminding ourselves that the human element and that people aren't just numbers is probably the most important thing that I will we'll want to tell leaders of the future. Uh, I think it's just, you know, it's only going to get better from a technology standpoint. We're only going to get more, you know, more advanced. Um, but just remembering that humans are at the, the heart of people analytics and people's lives are behind the numbers and people's, you know, emotions and feelings and thoughts and behaviors and all these things. And I think that's the IO psychologist of me is wanting to make sure people remember the psychology element and not just focus on the data and the business parts of it. It's such good advice. And uh, isn't it interesting how the more the technology develops and evolves and gets better, the, it's even more important that our power skills, like Josh Burson likes to call them, is empathy, is elite gratitude, is, you know, and all of those things um, that are human. Yeah. <laughs> related yeah, exactly. and those are the skills we need to develop in our leaders um and to, to make yeah. sure we have that compassion etc uh, and last thing where can people connect with you if you want to reach out say uh, hi linkedin follow. is probably the best uh, yeah Stephanie Murphy on LinkedIn. nice and for those that are listening definitely follow on LinkedIn. You're, you're really good on linkedin a lot of content great insights as well i love it i follow you there it's like kind of how i first came across you to kind of led to this show today um so yeah. make sure you go and connect and yeah i wish you all the best and so next week i really appreciate you coming on Thanks, Chris. Thanks for the time.